listening to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. Broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond. The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio Welcome to the X-Zone A place where fact is fiction And fiction is reality Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell Welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on the Mutual Broadcast Network, the Talkstar Radio Network, the Exxon Broadcast Network, and in Europe on Radio X. Now, you can always send me an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com, on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And you can listen to our radio website where we have archives, what we've done in the past, where we're going in the future, our guest list, and so much more at www.xzoneradio.com. My guest this hour is Tom Petusky. He is the founder of Scientific Confirmation of Paranormal Events, or Scope NJ, and their website is www.scopenj.com. Tom is a retired educator and holds a Bachelor of Arts and Master of Science degree. He has always had an intense interest in the paranormal and is the founder of Scope New, New Jersey, or Scope NJ, which once again is Scientific Confirmation of Paranormal Events. Now, Scope NJ is an organization dedicated to unraveling the mysteries of the paranormal and to helping others cope with the stress and anxiety associated with the exposure to unusual or strange phenomena. Tom and his wife Carol, along with the members of Scope NJ, have conducted paranormal investigations at select sites throughout the United States and Europe. Now, a visit to his website will reveal a wealth of information that supports the concept of life after death. Some of Tom's writings have appeared in Fate Magazine and Weird New Jersey. 
He also has an e-book, Precious Yesterdays, available through Amazon Kindle and Barnes & Noble Nook. Joining me now is Tom Petusky. And Tom, welcome to the X-Zone. Well, thank you very much, Rob. It's a pleasure to be on your show. Sir, the pleasure is all ours. Tell me, from educator holding a Bachelor of Arts degree and Master of Science degree to a paranormal investigator, I love the link, but I'd love to know what the story behind the story is. Well, as a matter of fact, I've always had an interest in the paranormal ever since I was a little kid. In fact, it goes back to my first investigation, which was when I was about 12 years old. A friend and I were coming home from a movie theater where we we had just seen uh, one of those old movies that uh, we always got excited about. You know, it was either Frankenstein or, right. uh, you know, Dracula, something like that. Well, we're walking across this bridge across the Elizabeth River. I lived in Elizabeth, New Jersey at the time. And there was always this old Victorian house on the bank there that uh, kind of uh, got us uh, interested. It looked abandoned. And one day we went into this house on the way home from this theater. And there were a lot of uh, exciting things that happened. One of the things was that somebody was still living there. And uh, I guess the most frightening thing was Initially, we went to the cellar through, you know, those old uh, storm doors they have where you lift them Mm -hmm. up and then you walk down these steps. Yeah. Well, my buddy and I went down the cellar, and that was our first inkling that somebody was living there because there were piles of ashes all over the floor. And then while we were down there, the light that was coming in from outside was suddenly blocked by something, and it turned out to be a man who was homeless coming down the stairs and he was what they a member of what they used to call the bottle gang you know they were poor souls that uh had no means to uh you know make a living and everything but that was the first time we got frightened uh as far as you know going into uh paranormal investigations and then of course uh when my wife and i eventually met in college we found a mutual interest in it and ever since then Uh, We always made it a point to uh, look for unexplained things. All right, Tom, please stand by. You and I have to take a brief break. We'll be back in two minutes. Exo Nation, my guest this hour is Tom Petusky, and he's the founder of Scientific Confirmation of Paranormal Events, or Scope NJ, and their website is scopenj.com. This is the Exxon, a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And we come to you seven days a week, Monday through Friday, live shows, Saturday, Sunday, the best of where? On the Mutual Broadcast Network, Exxon Broadcast Network, Talkstar Radio Network, and across Europe on Radio X. We'll be back after this break. Don't go away. Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life has no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Her wonderful book, The Fun of Dying, is available on Amazon and at stores worldwide wherever books are sold. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net.
While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Wilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we will weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Wilda Wiecka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Star began to demonstrate a metaphysical connection to the spirit world as a little girl. Her family noticed the connection, but it was a great-grandmother who told the family that Linnea was indeed gifted. The great-grandmother, who was also gifted, felt that Linnea had indeed inherited these attributes. It has been noticed that oftentimes, such things are passed down through the generations. Linnea was also born with a call, a thin white membrane across a newborn's face. Legend has it that if the baby is born with this call, the child will have second sight, or what we call psychic abilities. Linnea Starr does past, present, and future, and has the gift of prophecy. It is written within scriptures that if you are able to give factual information, and prophecies indeed come true, the gift indeed comes from the divine realm. Linnea Starr does large interactive groups as well as private gatherings. For more information on Linnea Star or to contact Linnea for a one-on-one consultation, visit her website at www.linneastar.com. That's www.l-i-n-n-e-a-s-t-a-r.com. Tom Pitkowski is our special guest this hour, Exonation, and uh, we're talking about the paranormal. Tom is the founder of Scientific Confirmation of Paranormal Events, and their website is scopenj.com. Tell me, Tom, why do you think in today's society, the year is 2016, that so many people are so interested in the paranormal? Well, I think uh, what spurred that on probably is uh, some of these early shows about, uh, you know, a paranormal investigation. You know, of course, the Ghost Hunter show was largely responsible for bringing a lot of this about. And it kind of blossomed. There's, um, there's thousands of paranormal research groups out there mm-hmm. now. We're just one of many. And uh, they have various uh, ways of expressing themselves. Uh, we are essentially a scientific approach. We have uh, a lot of equipment that we use to try and gather evidence. And most of the equipment is similar to what you see on some of these shows. And, of course, we go to a variety of venues to try and uh, you know, gather evidence. And many of these venues happen to be private residences. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have many, many stories that uh, relate to what we've experienced at these locations. And uh, one visit to our site would show any of your listeners the amount of evidence that we've collected over the years. Well, let me, let me ask you about the evidence, because there's over 16,000 yeah. groups in the United States that we have on mm-hmm. a database, all going out, all doing investigations, all trying to find the smoking gun to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is life after death, that ghosts are real, and so on and so forth. If all this evidence is being collected by members of these paranormal community members, how come the scientific community isn't getting behind you guys to prove it once and for all? 
Well, that's an interesting question, Rob. And I think what they're looking for is some kind of uh, foolproof evidence that is based upon uh, true research done in a laboratory-like setting. And, of course, you know and I know that's probably not very possible. But how can we say that when scientific research is being conducted on Mars, is being conducted on the moon, is being conducted on Space Lab, being conducted on the I- International Space uh, Station? How can we say that you know, science is looking for it to be replicated in a lab? Well, I think they don't have sufficient evidence now that has surfaced, mm-hmm. in my mind, uh, they feel they don't have enough evidence to actually proclaim that there is something to life after death. Um, you know, I've, I've been doing this for many years, mm-hmm. and I've convinced myself, because of the types of evidence that we've collected over time, that there is life after death. I mean, just take a simple uh, situation where we get a call from, let's say, a couple that's upset with something that's going on in their house, mm-hmm. And uh, we first conduct an interview. We try to ascertain whether it's something that uh, would require us to come in and help them. And um, fortunately, our our membership is a cross-section of expertise. I mean, we have uh, uh, people that are involved with construction, people that are involved with the trades. My son-in-law, Steve, he uh, runs a heating and air conditioning company. Mm -hmm. Um... My co-founder, John, he, he actually uh, uh, owns with his brother uh, a face, uh, what did he call it, uh, where you... And uh, we have a lot of technical expertise. Uh, we have somebody who's a retired lieutenant, police lieutenant, mm-hmm. who uh, assists in investigations. And then, of course, we have my wife, who's an educator. Mm-hmm. Uh, we come from all walks of life, and one of the things that we try to do is ascertain if there's some kind of natural cause behind what's going on in these houses. Sure, but before you and, go on, I, I, yeah. I, you know, I didn't hear you talk about three very important, or at least two very important professionals that I would consider are paramount on a team of investigators. Number one is a psychologist. Number well, two know, is a member right of the that, clergy. Yeah. Number two is a member of the clergy. Okay. Well, the clergy uh, aspect of it, in my mind, uh, would perhaps narrow uh, the the, uh, area too much because, as you know, there's all kinds of religions. Yes, but I also know that there are many members of the clergy who are, you know, are experts in many of the different religious philosophies. Yes, that's true. So why wouldn't you have a psychologist or a member of the clergy on board? Well, that's a good question, Rob. And uh, the only thing I can tell you is, uh, based upon what we do, Mm -hmm. we haven't haven't seen the need to bring about a a clergy member or a psychologist. Why not? Uh, I've had had some training in psychology. Yes, but you're not a psychologist. Okay. You know, are are you able to determine whether or not the haunting is, or or the the signs and symptoms of what the person is believing to be a haunting is an actual haunting, or psychosomatic? Well, the only thing I can tell you, Rob, um, is that I do have you know a number of criteria that I apply. Okay. Uh, when when we go on an investigation. And uh, very often, uh, we will find a natural cause for mm-hmm. something. It could be uh, maybe some animals in the attic creating noise. Right. It could be high electromagnetic fields that are making them nauseous mm-hmm. or maybe affecting their thinking. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've helped a number of people that way. We right. found a power line outside of a, a house that was affecting a baby that was waking up at 2 a.m. in the morning and screaming and hollering, and we showed the... Uh, the mother that uh, you know that has to be taken care of. Uh, we had we found uh, uh, radon gas in another cellar. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have ways of seeing if something is caused by some other means besides the paranormal. Gotcha. We try to rule all of that out first. 
Mm-hmm. And what I'm trying to point out is that some of the members who are skilled in working in the trades right. are able to determine whether or not, you know, it's a plumbing problem mm-hmm. that's making these noises or uh, something, uh, some other such thing. But if a person were to call their local city and and get a building inspector to come down, would the building inspector be able to do the same thing? Well, I can't vouch for that. I don't know for sure, okay. Rob. I really don't. I can't say if they would or wouldn't. But All right, so when when you go looking for the cause that is not been established by the members of the trade and the other members of your team. How do you go about looking for the paranormal? Okay, one of the most important things we do, Rob, is to try and do some background research on the place that we are researching Mm -hmm. or investigating. And uh, very often a list of former owners, for example, of a house can be obtained at a county clerk's office. And whenever we do electronic voice phenomena or the EVPs, We'll take some time to, uh, first of all, go to some of these areas in the house or other part of the venue where the activity has been taking place. And we'll go there and we'll call out the names of some of these former owners just to see if one of them is possibly causing what's going on. And we've gotten a lot of uh, responses over the years by calling out names of former owners. And... uh, We will do that. We will also set up, of course, equipment, closed-circuit television, camcorders. Uh, We do use a ghost box. I do feel that uh, the SP2 ghost box is a valid instrument, and we've gotten some good information from that. Uh, We try to also support uh, what we uh, detect by some other criteria. In other words, we won't accept just a photo or a video. We'll try to back it up with some uh, digital recording uh, or some uh, other criteria Mm -hmm. like temperature temperature drops or increases, humidity changes, to try and uh, confirm that there is some kind of thing going on there. And of course, you can't rule out uh, personal sensitivity. Uh, One of our members uh, it happens to uh, be an empath. She is very sensitive, and we employ her to go through with us, and she can very often um, right away see and you know, tell us that she feels something is going on there. So um, I, I do like to uh, share our information with, with the uh, clients when we finish an investigation after we've gone over all of the uh, material that we've collected and have rounded out some evidence, uh, we do present them uh, with uh, what we call an exit conference. You know, a ghost hunters show, they say, the reveal. Yeah. Well, it's kind of a ridiculous name for that. Uh, We call it an exit conference. Uh, I use that term because when I was in education, very often we would have state or federal monitoring teams come in to check our programs. Right. And, and uh, at the end of their investigation of our programs, we would have an exit conference with them. So that phrase seemed to really gel with me, and that's what we apply. We don't say we're going to have a reveal with the clients. We have an exit conference. Um, go ahead. No, no, no. I, w- I was just listening to you. Yes, sir. Well, anyway, uh, we've been to a number of locations. We've had some very exciting things happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was one incident, for example, where uh, my son-in-law, Steve, who's our tech manager, and my co-founder, John, the three of us were in uh, this two-family house on the second floor. They were having some suspected paranormal events going on, and one of the locations was supposed to be uh, the uh, living room. So we set up what we call a geophone, which is a vibration detector that has a bank of lights. We set that on a table. We set the old K2 meter, which you've seen on those shows, and we also had a tri-meter, which is good because you can set you can set an alarm factor on it, and that uh, will detect any kind of EMF as well. And John was doing some um, digital uh, voice recording work. He says, if there's somebody here in this room, mm-hmm. we welcome you to talk to us 
you know, please, please feel free to go over to the intr- instruments over there on the table. Touch them, get near them. All right, we're going to have to have a we're going to have to have a cliffhanger here because we have to take our news break. Okay. No problem. Exonation Tom Petusky is our guest this hour. ScopeNJ.com is the website, and I'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Thomas Jefferson was a Burgess of 27 when he met Martha Whale Skelton, a 22-year-old widowed heiress who was fondly called Patty by her family. They were married on January the 1st, 1772, and they took up residence in a cabin on the building site on top of a Virginia mountain that Thomas had named Monticello. As Thomas and Patty slowly built their first version of the great house at Monticello, the Revolutionary War was heating up. Patty, with difficulty, bore five children, but only two girls survived. Thomas's political career developed to the point where he was often away from home, but after he authored and signed the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia, he resolved never again to leave his wife. He was elected the governor of Virginia, just as that state became the revolution's last battleground. The Revolutionary War ended in 1781, and Thomas gladly retired altogether to my family, my farm, and my books. But Patty continued to want to bear her treasured husband a son, and late in the summer of 1782, she died of kidney failure at the age of 33, four months after having borne yet another girl. Thomas was so devastated by her death that he never remarried, He mourned her for the rest of his life, even as he helped to frame the peace in France and then became the first Secretary of State, the second Vice President, and the third President of the United States. This story is true. Thomas Jefferson was such an obsessive letter writer and record keeper that we know where he was and what he was doing nearly every day of his adult life. Every significant thing he says in My Thomas comes from his contemporary writings. My Thomas by Roberta Grimes is now available at Barnes & Noble, Costco, Target, Books A Million, Hudson Booksellers, Kmart, Walmart, Sam's Club, Walgreens, CVS, and online at Amazon.com. You can visit Roberta Grimes online at www.robertagrimes.com. The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. 
Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Unwilling to be the government's deadly assassin, gifted psychic Kahara Mitchell went AWOL and ended up buried under rubble in the wake of a great tsunami. She regained consciousness far from Earth on the medical ship of a Dagaronian intergalactic fleet. Has she been rescued or abducted by aliens? The Chalice of Carrie, Kahira O'Donnell's latest paranormal science fiction romance, is the passionate story of an Earth woman and her destined mates, twin kings from another galaxy. Kahara uses her gifts fighting alongside Lords Rom and Ra in a war that will determine the destiny of galaxies. The Chalice of Kari by Kahira O'Donnell is now available at kahiraodonnell.com or at amazon.com. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. What Happened in Benghazi is revealed by Nicholas Genix, author of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. He informs the American people that President Obama deceived them by advocating a strong foreign policy prior to the 2012 presidential election, and Hillary Clinton supported this deception. As the title infers, there is a connection between Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. Ample evidence informs Americans that Obama's early indoctrination in the Quran developed an infinity for Islam, why the Quran is the source of discontent in many countries, and why the Obama foreign policy deception led to poor military action and caused the loss of American lives in Benghazi. Genix provides 36 questions for the Select Committee on Benghazi to validate if Americans are justified to mistrust President Obama and Hillary Clinton. An overview of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi is presented on the website www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Annie Callahan, dedicated to negotiating a position for Earth within the Dagaronian coalition, had trained for three years to become an Earth ambassador. Yet, the very eve of her arrival at the capital ruling planet, she is claimed as destined mate to an oversized, mating maddened vamp who swears he will never release her. Lord Astaran, king of the Macian sector, has waited over 900 years for his destined mate, Having found her as an alpha vamp, he is unable to relinquish Annie, virtually holding her hostage until he can claim her. Yet Macians cannot survive without their mate's love. How could he strip her of her citizenship, her ambassadorship, and her freedom and expect to win her heart? With All That I Am by Kahira O'Donnell is the latest book in this exciting series, The Dagaronian Chronicles, guaranteed to keep readers coming back for more. With All That I Am by Kahira O'Donnell is available on Amazon.com and KahiraO'Donnell.com. Welcome back, everyone. Tom Petusky is our guest this hour. He is with Scope NJ. Their website is scopenj.com. And uh, before we went to the break, uh, Tom, you were telling us about this this house that you and your team were investigating, and your son-in-law or your son had put some instruments on a table and had invited a spirit to to speak. So tell me what happened. Well, again, we had those three instruments on the table, and mm -hmm. uh, there were three of us there. My co-founder, John, was also there. 
and he was uh, asking for someone to respond for our digital uh, recorder. And uh, after he said that, the geophone, which is a vibration detector, started flashing. Uh, the K2 lights flickered all over the place. And then the, the trimeter, and I'm standing maybe about two feet away from the trimeter, all of a sudden that, that went on a steady tone. And anyone who's used a trimeter knows that most of the time you just get a little beep or something like that. There was a steady tone which led us to believe that somebody actually turned the knob on the thing. Well, uh, to make a long story short, eventually when we played this uh, digital recording back on uh, our computer, there was a gruff voice that said, mm -hmm. there's your proof. So somebody knew that mm -hmm. we were trying to gather data, and they said, there's your proof. Now, when you go into these investigations and you use all this uh, high-tech equipment, do you take into account for microwave towers and cell towers and cell transmissions and other well, other electronic, uh, such as uh, yeah, infrared yeah, remotes yeah. and radar units yeah. and so on and so forth? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And also, uh, there's been an argument that the digital recorder may be picking up some segment of radio broadcasting. Exactly. Okay. But when you get direct responses for uh, any questions that you might you mm -hmm. know, pose with your digital, while you're running your digital recorder, you get a direct response. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, it leads you to believe, hey, we actually did make contact. We do have somebody here. But what about the and information now that's coming out of from neuroscience where they are saying that it is quite possible for the human thought process to actually transmit a thought that can be captured by a digital or analog recording system. Just like the human mind is responsible for telekinesis, the human mind is responsible for poltergeist. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's a, you know, a theory that might mm -hmm. be uh, true. Who yeah. knows? Uh, we don't know with this, that's for sure. And I've even read where uh, a thought could possibly even produce a manifestation. Yes, that's right, yeah. Kind of ghost, something like that. Mm-hmm. Of course, this is a, a lot of unknown territory that we're going into. Um, but what happens but if all the manifestations and all the EVPs are actually being caused by those people who are seeking the truth and it's through their own um, psyche that they're creating the evidence uh -huh. that they're looking for? Well, you have to take into account, um, you know, the sound of the voice also that you're hearing, if mm -hmm. it matches one of your own people, of course, that would be suspect. Well, only if the suspect. voice was audible, if the voice, mm -hmm. you, you know, if, yeah. if somebody in your team said it. But we don't know what a voice would sound like through thought, do we? Through, through, tele through telepathy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can get into all of these arguments and try to debunk all of this. It's not trying to debunk. Sure. It's not trying to debunk. What it's trying to do is establish the reality of the claim. Mm -hmm. By the way, Rob, if yes. you're hearing a, a, kind of like a squeaking sound, I got this beautiful old chair that I use by my computer. So yeah, that's no, not we're, a ghost here. No, we're not, not hearing any squeaking. No, we're not, we're, not, <laughs> we're not hearing any squeaking uh, whatsoever. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. Okay. Yeah, I got this creaky chair that's been here for a few years. And let, let me ask you, what is, how many members are there of uh, Scope NJ? Well, it's, it's uh, just increased now. Mm -hmm. We have approximately uh, 10 members. Wow. And uh, we don't use everybody at once. Mm -hmm. And uh, we try to tailor the uh, number of participants according to uh, the convenience of the client and what mm -hmm. kind of uh, uh, resources we would need as far as personnel. Right. And because uh, we, we don't always bring all of our equipment to a particular location. We don't bring all of our people. But, uh, you know, we try to set a maximum maybe of six, seven right. tops. Uh, we try to keep it below that. Uh, Do you folks charge for your services? Good. No, we don't. We don't charge. We, we do, uh, if anybody asks us mm -hmm. who uh, wants our services, we tell them, well, uh, if, you, you know, if you want to contribute, yeah. uh, we can always use it to cover expenses. I said, but that's entirely up to you. Right. 
But one of the nice things that we do for our clients is to give them a uh, word processed report uh, discussing each phase of the investigation. And um, we also tell them that if they want to give us a flash drive, we'll give them a copy of anything that we've found so that they can use it for themselves. And I've been archiving all of our stuff, just like you archive your uh, programs. I've got, I've got investigations archived here in, mm -hmm. in uh, different formats. Um, so, um, someday I'll write a book about it, Rob. What about you? What's your take on orbs? Well, uh, that's uh, another excellent question. Um, of course, you know it's highly controversial. As um, is so everything in the paranormal. You, yeah. Yeah, what I'm going to tell you is essentially uh, what I think, uh, you know, mm -hmm. is. Uh, I think most orbs are nothing more than just dust or water particles in the air. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I do believe that there may be some orbs that uh, seem to be controlled by intelligence. We, we show that on some video on our uh, website. They behave in ways that uh, seem to demonstrate that. Um, also, uh, one of the things that I think is, is positive as far as identification for it being something other than just a dust particle or water particle is if it's partially obscured behind something. Uh, if if uh, there is an orb that's partially uh, hidden by, let's say, shrubbery outside, if we're doing an outside investigation around the property, mm -hmm. Or if it's in an attic and it's, uh, you know, we see an orb in the attic and part of it is behind maybe some clothing that's hanging on hangers, something like that. But why couldn't that be, uh, a, why couldn't that be a particle of dust? Well, it seems to be uh, the, I, it seems to be the belief that most of your particles are only inches away from your uh, camera lens. Mm, I don't know about that. Uh, it depends on what the aperture of the lens is and, you know, what the field of, well, the, you're absolutely right yeah. on that regard, too, because I remember going into a cave mm -hmm. uh, in one of these Caribbean uh, countries that we visited, and it was an underground waterfall, and by God, there were, there were thousands of orbs there. So uh, you're absolutely right in that regard, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm only going by, uh, you know, some of the reading that I've, some of the research that sure. I've done, and it seems that uh, there's three kinds of... Um, ways that an orb will appear uh it could it could actually um reflect light from a light source mm -hmm. uh or it could generate its own light um or there's, there's something something that we don't know about uh but uh i'm of the opinion that um it will not reflect light so much as generate its own light i think a spirit orb might generate its own light uh, we do see that in some of the video that we capture. Okay, here's something that I have a hard time with. You only hear EVPs on a recording. You only see orbs in a picture. If orbs are real, why can't you see them with the naked eye? Well, uh, I, can, I can tell you right now, one of the most recent observations or investigations we did mm -hmm. was at a 1868 historic private residence in Moorestown, New Jersey. The video is on our site, mm -hmm. and you will see me sitting at a table where we were doing a ghost box session, and you will see orbs floating over the table, and you will see me pointing them out. Mm -hmm. I actually saw them going over the table. You weren't looking so, at a monitor? Yes. I mean, I wasn't looking at a monitor. I actually saw the orbs. Mm. We had a CCTV camera in the opposite side of the room that picked up on us. It captured me mm -hmm. pointing to the orbs to the other people, right. and you can see the orbs floating over the table. So it is possible to actually see the orbs. Um, uh, okay, so, that, so if the orbs can be seen, if the orbs can be seen, why can't the orbs be presented to a member of the scientific community to sit there, see the orbs, and have them try to explain it? I wouldn't know how to duplicate or replicate those orbs. You know? Uh, but if they were there for you... you could, I don't know how you can replicate it so that you could see it. 
All right, well, but if they, were, if they were there for you and your team, why wouldn't they be there if a member of the scientific community came there to do an investigation with you? Well, it's very possible, but mm-hmm. uh, quite frankly, uh, I, I believe I'm the only one that saw them. Because if you look at the video, mm-hmm. you'll see I'm the only one pointing it out. There's a, one of our members sitting in a sofa on the other mm-hmm. side of the room, and one of our other team members on the right, a female, right, uh, sitting, and uh, I pointed to him, hmm. and nobody affirmed that. So I guess I'm the only one that saw him, but it, they do appear on the video. Now, let me ask you, uh, do you wear glasses or contact lenses? I wear glasses. Were you wearing glasses at the time of the orbs? Yes, I always wear glasses. Were the other members of your team wearing glasses? Uh, one young fellow, no. Chad wasn't. Um, Diane wasn't either. So two out of three. And you saw the orbs wearing glasses. Two people who weren't wearing glasses didn't see the yeah. orbs. That's true. And, the camera, the, and the camera lens is made of glass, and it also picked up the, the, uh, the orbs. It's hmm. fixed, though. It's a fixed camera. It's not moving. Yeah. Uh, it's stationary. But I will say this. The orbs were traveling through the air. Right. They were moving through the air. Um, uh, you know, a lot of this is unexplained. Sure. We can only, we can only report what we see. And, uh, you know, we don't try to conclude that a, there is a paranormal event taking place in a house or the house isn't haunted mm-hmm. unless we have sufficient evidence. Now, what do you consider as sufficient evidence? Well, I, I think I alluded to that earlier. If you have something else to back it up. Now, we did have something else to back up those orbs going over because at the time they were going over that table, while mm-hmm. I was pointing them out, uh, Diane was picking up uh, spikes on her K2 meter. So that's one source of confirmation right there. Is it enough? Well, it's hard to say. We don't know. Where do you, where do you see where do you see the quest for the answers in the paranormal 10, 15 years from now? Well, I think you're going to uh, eventually probably have more sophisticated equipment coming out that uh, will better uh, detect paranormal events. I mean, we have mm-hmm. some things now that uh, individually can't by themselves positively confirm that you have a paranormal event taking place. So what we're doing basically is trying to stack up evidence right. of any given event to support it, whether it's you know a, a, a temperature drop mm-hmm. in the room, or and then with that an EVP. You know, try to have things uh, kind of like support one another before you can say, well, you know, you probably have got something going on here. But what happens 10, 15 years from now with more sophisticated equipment? And the sophisticated equipment proves that orbs, spiritual communication, the belief in spirits roaming the earth are explained scientifically, but they're not real or what the perception of them is presently what happens well we'll have to wait and see won't we rob (laughs) we'll have to wait and see but uh i do i do believe in other dimensions Mm -hmm. i do believe that some of this phenomena is a result of uh, a crossover from other dimensions and um you know you can i'm sure you've had guests over the years that have proclaimed that uh, a lot of these uh, so-called creatures, whether they're uh, fairies, mm-hmm. whether whether they're uh, trolls or uh, vampires or something like that, uh, who's to say that in some other dimension they don't exist and that from time to yeah. time they cross over? But who's so to sure say that, heard all but, about that? Oh, sure, I have. But who's but to say? Who's to say? For sure. Who's to say? Right. And re, who's to say? In actuality, there are other dimensions. Who's to say that? The quest or the search for the paranormal is a human trait to try and make this existence more exciting than it really is. Well, you raise a good point, and that brings in that whole concept of matrixing or pareidolia, Mm -hmm. where somebody may see something that they believe it's uh, paranormal, and it's actually uh, something that uh, can be explained away as being natural. 
So uh, you raise a good point there. I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago, I think about seven or eight years ago, I was invited to do a uh, be a guest on a friend of mine's show in Toronto. And we conducted an experiment. I went down to the corner of Bloor Street and Young in downtown Toronto, and all I did was looked up. I didn't say a word. I didn't point. I was just looking up, straight up. Uh Within about three minutes, there were about 30, 40 people there (laughs) telling me that they could see the object in the sky. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing there. All I was doing was looking up. Well, that that uh, was fascinating to hear, and uh, I don't deny uh, that taking place uh, in in everyday yeah. life. So, so this uh, this makes the, this makes me wonder how much of the paranormal is being created by those who are having the experience compared to the actuality of the experience really happening. Mm-hmm. Yes, I can see your point. But, uh, you know, when you go ahead and you start listening to EVPs Mm -hmm. and get direct responses, let's say, from former owners, and, you know, they proclaim their name again, Mm -hmm. or they say, yes, I'm here, you know, something like that. Um, That Moorestown house we did recently, for example, in the master bedroom, Oh, I was going to say that uh, we had some confirmation from an EVP. All right, let's take a break. Let's talk about this house when we come back from this break because I've got to take my final break. Exo Nation, Tom Petusky is our guest. He is the co founder of Scientific Confirmation of Paranormal Events, scope nj.com. This is the Exo, and I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you around the world on the Talkstar Radio Network, Exo Broadcast Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, and in Europe on Radio X. We'll be back on the other side as we wrap up this hour here in the Exo. Don't go away. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at songsandstoriesforsoldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. You're listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. If you enjoy reading a good mystery with a touch of the paranormal, then you'll love From Out of the Woodwork by William S. Peckham. Sean Kennedy, a Toronto contractor, buys derelict houses, guts them, and turns them into multifamily dwellings. When Sean buys 29 Livery Lane, a century house in ruins, and starts the renovation, the house fights back. 
He is visited by ghosts of owner's past. His visions are triggered by touching an oak mantle, reading a faded letter, opening an old locket, or opening a brand new casket in the basement. These visions will take you on a trip across southern Ontario from Niagara Falls to Toronto to Kingston. From Out of the Woodwork is now available in paperback and on your favorite electronic reader. To order your copy of From Out of the Woodwork, go to www.williamspeckham.com. That's www.williamspeckham.com. Tom Petusky is our guest of this hour. Tom, have you or any of the members of your team ever had any physical interaction with spirits? Definitely, yes. Um, one of the uh, locations that we were investigating was the Jenny Wade House mm-hmm. in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And uh, the team that was there was my wife, my son-in-law, Steve, my daughter, Michelle, and my granddaughter, Ashley. And uh, just a quick review that uh, Jenny Wade was the only civilian casualty during the Battle of Gettysburg. And she was in this duplex house that happened to be right on the line between where the Confederates were and where the Union soldiers were. Right. And uh, Jenny had been in the kitchen baking bread for the Union Army and a Confederate soldier, Confederate sniper, uh, fired a, one of those uh, rounds through two doors of the Jenny Wade house, the side door, and then it went through a connecting door from the living room to the kitchen. It went through two doors and hit Jenny square in the back. Ouch. And uh, she, uh, she got hit in the heart and died instantly. Her mother was in the, in the kitchen with her when it happened. Uh, we were investigating that house. And uh, Jenny was uh, eventually transported to the cellar by Union troops be- before they had a chance to bury her. She was resting down there. Well, anyway, we had equipment down there, and uh, it just so happened that my granddaughter was down in the cellar with my wife, and they were doing some uh, you know, equipment work. Mm-hmm. And my granddaughter got grabbed on the ankle. And... Uh, she, you know, exclaimed, wow, what was that? You know, she got grabbed, and then she got poked in the butt. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that was the first incident. Now, at that same investigation, at one point, we were in the uh, uh, living room adjoining the kitchen where Jenny died, and I was doing some EVP work with a digital recorder, and standing next to my right there was my wife, to my left was my daughter, Michelle, and maybe about two feet away from her was her husband, Steve. And while we were doing this EVP work, uh, Michelle was tapped on the shoulder, and she turned to Steve. She says, what? He says, what do you mean? She says, what do you want? He says, "Uh, I I didn't do anything. She says, you tapped me on the shoulder. He says, no, I didn't. So I had the EVP, uh, I had the uh, digital recorder, rather, there, and I said, all right, who tapped Michelle on the shoulder? And playing it back, the response was, Gary did it. Who's Gary? I don't know, but Gary did it. Perhaps some research would reveal, you know, if we delved into it enough, that uh, Gary was somebody associated with that house or not. I never got to that point. Tom, the time has come, unfortunately, when you and I must say so long. I want to thank you so much for joining us, XO Nation. My guest this hour has been Tom Petusky. He is the co-founder of Scientific Confirmation of Paranormal Events. Uh, their website is scopenj.com. Once again, XO Nation, I want to believe. I really do want to believe. I want proof. I don't want EVPs. I don't want murky photos. I don't want orbs. I want proof. And when people keep telling me that the scientific community will not get behind this because of the lack of evidence, I've got to tell you something, Exxon Nation. It makes you wonder. 
Until tomorrow night, Exxon Nation, thank you for joining us. Always a great pleasure. Thank you for allowing us to be part of your your night, your day, no matter where you are in this great big world of ours. I'll be back tomorrow night as we continue our quest to find the truth. So until then, remember, always keep your eyes to the sky and your heart to the light. Good night, everyone. Thank you.